Here we go. Acts 19, verse 1. It says, And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples, and he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, No, we have not heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, Into what were you baptized? They said, Into John's baptism. And Paul said, John's baptism, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. There were about 12 men in all. Now I'm going to go ahead and read the next little section, because if we're hopefully going to close with it. And he entered the synagogue, and for three months, this is in Ephesus, spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when, he, but when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years, so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. <clears throat> um, Apollos has taken off and gone to Corinth. Uh, after about two years of rest and recovery, Paul has now made it back to Ephesus. And uh, our text tells us that he found there some disciples. <clears throat> and he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit since you believe? And what I find interesting is the fact that it's been like it's, it's been over 20 years, about 25 years since the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. And yet here was a group of people that were uh, disciples teaching something, and yet we're not really sure what it was they were teaching. Uh, which reminds me of a story in the Old Testament, 2 Samuel 18, where Joab sent in a message to David. And uh, Ahimez says, uh, let me have the message and I'll run and give it to David. And, and he looks at me, he says, no, not today. He said, it's not, you're not running. And he brings a Cushite and he says to the Cushite, he said, here's the message, go give it to David. Anybody familiar with the story? Anyway, the, the Cushite, Cushite takes off running with the message. And uh, if, if you picture it like I do, I see Ahimez as he's over and he's just like... <laughs> But I want to run, but I want to run. And, and finally, Joab looks at him and says, you know what? Go ahead, run. You don't have a message, but go ahead. You want to run, run. And boy, he takes off like a deer. And he actually passes the Cushite and he gets to David. When he gets to David, David says, what's the message? And he's like, I don't know, but I'm here first. <laughs> we don't know what the message was, but they were communicating it. They were out there spreading the word of something to those that would listen. Some believe that they were disciples of John since they were actually received the baptism of John. Um, but it's difficult to imagine that in that scenario, they wouldn't really know who Jesus is, but they, John had disciples before Jesus' appearance. And so who knows how that may be. Um, but you know, when John identified Jesus as the Messiah, as the, the Lamb of God, Two of his disciples immediately left and began to go with Jesus at that point. And so there was a familiarity with who Jesus is. But, you know, sometimes there's not the connection. Sometimes people have, you know, okay, well, he's, he's the Lamb of God, uh, but I'm waiting for the Messiah. And sometimes there's that disconnect. And I think in America, there's a tremendous problem with this disconnect in the fact that people know the person of Jesus Christ, but they don't know the relationship of Jesus Christ inside of their heart and their life. Um, and so I can't hardly take a subject like that and not go into it with a little bit of, of information that I need to make sure it's communicated to you because this, this concept is a modern problem, I believe. There's a huge disconnect in people between the person of Jesus Christ, who he was as a historical figure, uh, and knowing him as Lord and Savior of your life. And that disconnects even in churches where people have the knowledge and they gather together because, hey, it's Jesus. He's, you know, he's the son of God and, and, uh, and he died for the world. 
But that in itself is not quite enough because I, let's be honest, and I don't know if, you, if, if you're familiar with this. Did you know that if you went to India and you spent some time with a bunch of Hindus that you would actually come across Hindus who believe in Jesus? Yeah. They just add him to the rest of those 10,000 gods that they've got. There's not a Muslim in the world does not believe in Jesus. Every demon in hell believes in Jesus. There are millions of Americans who have a concept of Jesus. Many of them even go to church. They believe in Jesus, but they don't know him as Lord of their life. They're not saved. It's not a matter whether you believe in him. It's a matter of whether or not he is the Lord of your life. And I'm going to tell you something. I'm making reference to, of course, in, in Acts uh, 16.31, where the jailer was asked about how to be saved. And I'm going to, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm disappointed. The translations, just about all of them, except for the Berean, which I'm becoming more and more a fan of. But, but in every translation, they've all shifted to believe in Jesus and you'll be saved. Ah, wrong answer. That actual word, uh, epe, is, it, it, there's no place in the definition or the words that it translates into. There's not one place in there where it says in. Every, every word that can be used in that place right there, the predominant are two, on or unto. Okay? See, it's not a matter that you believe in him. It's a, it's a matter of whether or not you have believed on him for your salvation, for the, for the transformation of his work on the cross for you to remove your sins. Very important that that is actually known. And, and I believe that there are churches full of people who, who absolutely believe in the historic Jesus. They believe in Jesus. They believe that he was a real person. They even give him credit for being the son of God. Kudos for you, but not the same, not the same. Uh, much of Christianity has, has not got the big picture, which is this right here, okay? Redemption. This whole concept of redemption is like, you see, we have to be redeemed. It's not a matter of just believing that he exists or that he is. It's a matter of believing that he is the redeemer of mankind, Redemption, the very definition of it is the act of saving or being saved from sin, error, and evil. All right? So that means that I not only need to believe in his existence, I need to believe on him that my sins are forgiven, that he removes the evil in me and replaces it with his righteousness. That's an important factor in true salvation. Um, so I'm going to give it to you in a nutshell. Because if you're here, and I don't know where you're at, I hope and pray every one of you say, but some of you I don't really know that well. So I'm going to lay it out there for everybody. Ready? Salvation in a nutshell. Here it is. We are sinners by nature. Nobody has to teach you how to sin. You can do that all by yourself. Right? Jesus came to bear our sins and to receive God's judgment in our place. That's what he came to do. Through faith and repentance... Important factor, faith and repentance, Jesus' redemption, redemptive work is personalized into us. See, until that, it's sort of out there. It's, it's for the whole world. He died for the whole world, but the whole world's not saved. But when, but by forgiveness and rep, well, by repentance and by faith, then that work becomes personalized to me. And he becomes my savior, my redeemer, who removes the sin and the evil out of my life and gives me a brand new life. That's very important. This genuine exchange means that you surrender your life to his lordship and you now have a new life in Christ. And folks, that is a necessity for heaven. It's not a necessity to go to church, but it's a necessity to go to heaven. And I don't want anybody to be good with the fact that they go to church and not good in their relationship so that they're ready to go to heaven. So we're taking a moment to talk about it. 
Listen, Jesus didn't die to be a martyr in history. He died because the only way our souls could be saved and the evil and the sin could be removed off of it is by him becoming the replacement of our sins, taking the judgment of God, and by bearing that, give us the ability to have his righteousness imposed upon us. He took my sin, he took my sins, and I am taking his righteousness. And that transfer right there is your salvation. All right, so working through the passage, we see this. It says he found some disciples. Uh, Paul found some guys. They're, they're, they're teaching something, and they must be serious, must be committed, because they've invested years in it. Uh, however, Paul led was led in some form or fashion by seeing them. The Bible says seeing disciples. So even Luke, the, the, the mentality is, is they're believers of some form or fashion. But... They must not have it all together because what do we read? He asked him, he says, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe? He looks at it and his first thought is, well, okay, maybe it's a, it, it's a disconnection between the understanding of the Holy Spirit. But the fact of it is, is their response is this. No, we've not even heard there is a Holy Spirit. Okay, well, that's a big, that's a big, you know, telltale sign. Something's missing in this gospel message here. Um, and so I want you to get this. They have been sincere. They obviously had to be sincere because for years they were communicating something. And the best we can tell is you need to repent because the Messiah is coming. You need to repent. You need a turning of your ways. Very good. But, and this is tremendously important, I think. They were sincere, but they were wrong. You can be sincerely wrong. You can be. One of the biggest questions I've had people ask me is, so you think that these people who do not believe in Jesus, but are absolutely convinced in what they do believe, that they're going to go to hell? I'm sorry. Yes. Yes. Because it doesn't matter how sincere you are about what you believe, you must believe the right thing. If I fly through a stop sign, and the officer pulls me over and I tell him, I really believe that was a yield sign. Back up. Nope. Red. Stop. It doesn't matter if you believe something sincerely. If it's not truth, it will not set you free. It will not change your life. <clears throat> so... They did not know about the finished work of Christ on the cross. We see that because of what happened. And nor did they understand the work of the Holy Spirit because of what happened. There was no judgment in his question. He just went to him and did what he always does. He saw somebody, it looked like something was missing, and he, and he began to have dialogue with them. Exactly what you and I can do all the time. When, we, when we're having conversation and it doesn't look like they know who Jesus is, hey, engage in dialogue and begin to see where they're at. Very important. So, starting with what they knew, he began to clarify Jesus or John's teaching about Jesus and that Jesus not only was the Messiah, but that he died on the cross. And they heard this. And when, when they saw that he was what John had preached about and that he'd come and done the work, it says, on hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. That was their salvation moment. They had beliefs, but this was their salvation moment. Baptism into, the, into Jesus is, is basically what baptism in water is all about. It is a representation of something that happens. And that is as Christ died and was resurrected, you and I die to our sins, resurrected in new life to be with him. That was their salvation moment. Um, their genuine moment. And I, a lot of it I see right here. There are quite a few of you that are in this church that you would say, I was raised in church, been in church all my life. Right? How many of, how many of you was raised in church? All right, quite a few of you. I think you will agree with that, what I'm about to say. Even though you were raised in church and you may not can pinpoint a day or a time, the reality of it is, is there was a moment when it began to click. 
You know what I mean? You were raised around, you, were, you went through Sunday school and you were taught and all that kind of stuff. But there was a moment when it became personal and you at that moment believed and received. I like the way Peter says it in John 6, 69 about that sort of what I call that moment when it clicks. He says, we have believed and have come to know. We have believed, now we've come to know that you are the Holy One from God. I'm taking a moment right here because this is a huge moment. Folks, a lot of times the information gets stuck right here. We get the information, but what has to happen is that clicking moment. There's gotta be that moment in everybody's life. Maybe you're raised in church, maybe you're, maybe you're sitting in church right now and, and, and your whole concept is, well, you know, I've been in church all my life. I can tell you all the different little things I can quote to you, John 3, 16 and all that kind of stuff. Listen, that's really not what matters. What really matters is the moment when it takes substance, whether it is that Jesus loves you and died for your sins and you accept that, whether it's the moment you believe that the Holy Spirit is a gift he wants for you, whether it's the moment that you begin to realize that the word of God is his letter to you and it's valuable and the more you study it, the more it brings life and joy and transformation into you, or whether it's a, a biblical concept that you've heard forever and ever, like tithing, and you just thought, I don't know, that's for other people, that's an Old Testament thing or whatever. Can you ever see me talk this fast? I think I must have took something in my coffee. But anyway point of it is, is that at some particular point, it clicks. And when it does, it's like, oh, and we begin to live and believe that that's relevant and it changes everything. That moment changes everything. And when it does, folks, you're changed. And I believe if it's the real deal and you really got it, you don't even want to go back to any of that junk that you came out of. You know, and you may not remember the exact moment, but you're the living proof in many cases that it happened. I'm the living proof. I cannot tell you what age I was when I got saved. I can't tell you anything about the, anything about it except I, the best of my remembrance, it was a Friday night. But it doesn't really matter. Point is, is this is the living proof, the transformation. And so you're here and I pray you're here because you've been transformed because it became real. It clicked in you. All right. Returning to our text, it says, When Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. Now, some of you have been here at different times when we've talked about the subject of the Holy Spirit, and some of you may think, well, I think we've covered that, but I'm in another thing, I don't know. Because I don't know when you're here and what part of it you got and what part you may not have gotten or understood. So I'm going to try to explain it to you really quickly. And, and if this is new information, don't, don't, don't shut it down. Just, just follow me. All Christians have the Spirit of God in them when they get saved. Okay? It's His Spirit in us that bears witness that we are sons of God. You don't get saved unless the Spirit of God in you brings you to life. Okay? But the Holy Spirit is a gift that Jesus wanted the church to have because it was to help them be effective and more bold in the life that they're supposed to live. Um, so there are several passages in Acts that show people who are believers receiving the Holy Spirit. Why? Well, first of all, because they were believers, and it's what God wanted every believer to understand and to know. Um, the baptism of the Holy Spirit was given to empower, to enable us to operate in the gifts of the church. Now, I want you to follow me on this. Paul dedicated some time to explain that there are gifts for the church. I'm going to tell you, as a pastor, you're a gift to me. But did you know that you are also a gift to the body? You're a gift to the body. Why is that? Because every one of you have been endowed with a gift, but you don't really understand a lot of that sometimes until you understand what the Holy Spirit's purpose is. But I want you to know this. You have a gift that the Holy Spirit wants to operate through you for the body of the believers. Just like every person here that is a Christian is part of the body of Christ. And by virtue of that, you bring something into the mix. You add and make it better in, in, in whatever area it is that God has anointed you or gifted you to serve. 
There is no way around it. So don't stone the messenger. There's no way around it. When you look at Acts, there was something that happened when people received the Holy Spirit. Many of them, the predominant thing that you see is that they spoke in tongues. And a lot of times there was prophecy. Okay? I believe in that. If you look at church history, church history shows that that's been the evidence through the years. Every time it sort of dwindled down, be birthed back again by a moving of the Holy Spirit, and that began to happen. But here's what I need you to get very, very important. The greatest proof, and I've said this, and I really hope you get it. The greatest proof of the Holy Spirit's indwelling is the fruit. I've seen people that have had a gift and they've misused it. But you show me a person that has the fruit of the Spirit, and I'll show you somebody that's living like Jesus wants them to live. How do I know an apple tree is an apple tree? Well, hopefully it's got fruit on it, right? But if I go out there and I see an apple, I can say, oh, an apple tree. And I'm praying that in three years, I can go out into my yard and say, oh, an apple tree. Now, I say that because I want you to get this part right here. Paul wrote this, and I believe this firmly. And you, listen, I, I pray in the Spirit. I've done it for years. But listen, 1 Corinthians 13, 1. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Do you understand that? The greatest witness of the Holy Spirit is the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our life. Because the fruit of the Spirit, now notice it says fruit, it doesn't say fruits, and we're not fruity. The fruit of the Spirit is love. And it manifests itself, joy, peace, patience, kindness. But that, that, that love, because according to 1 John, God is love. And if we have not love, we don't have him. So the most important thing that the Lord wants all of us to have is the Holy Spirit so that the fruit of the Spirit is becoming evident in our life so that everybody can see that the same love of God is the same love that's in us because God has put it there. Since the goal of the Holy Spirit is to enable us to live and look like Jesus, by displaying his, displaying his character, I believe 100%, he wants everybody to have the Holy Spirit. And if you believe you have it right now, that's fine. But I, listen, because I, I am absolutely confident in what I'm about to say. God has two gifts. Boom, there it is. God has two gifts for every person. Jesus' salvation and the Holy Spirit's infilling. He has two gifts for every person. <clears throat> and here's what I want you to know about it. It's, it's just as simple. He wants you to have it. Ask him for it. Just ask him. Best thing I have found out when somebody wants to give me a gift is to take it and say thank you. And if you haven't asked, then I challenge you to ask. And you say, and, and, if, and if you're here and you say, I, 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 I am full of the Holy Spirit. Well, praise God, run with it, run with it. But if you were here, if you're here and you weren't brought up in this capacity and you don't have any knowledge about it, then I'm going to tell you real simple, just say, Holy Spirit, fill me. Because look where we're going with this. You see, here's bottom line. In this passage, we see something that I believe is characteristic of God. Will the camera lose me if I walk down? Probably. Probably. Never mind. Point is, if I was going to give you something, I was going to give it to you. And you looked at me and said, why do you want me to have it? And I said, because it's just going to make life better. It's going to help you a lot of ways. People that were raised around it, they begin to understand that. 
I have a good friend, Lewis, was not raised in church at all. Sunday morning, he comes down to, back then, a lot of times you'd come to the front to the altar to be prayed for for salvation. He came down to the front to the altar, prayed, and he accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. The next Sunday when he came back, he was told, hey, God has a gift for you. It's called the Holy Spirit. And he said, well, I want it. And so then the Lord gave him the Holy Spirit that Sunday. He just retired from pastoring 40-something <laughs> years. Boom, boom. Boom, boom. Why? Because here's what the Bible tells us. John 16, 7. Jesus says, I have a helper. A helper. What's the purpose of the Holy Spirit? To help us. Come on, look at me. You don't have to get glum and bum. How many of you want all the help you can get? That's me. I want all the help I can get. And so if, he's, if, if I'm pretty strong in Jesus, but he makes me stronger, praise God. If I'm pretty effective in Jesus, but he makes me more effective, praise God. If I'm, I'm pretty bold on good days, but he makes me bold on every day, praise God. If it's to help me, I want it. When we get that mentality, then just like these guys right here, we're like, well, I just want the whole deal. I just want the whole package. Now, I encourage you. If you have any questions, holler at me. But man, the Lord just wants to give you a gift to help you be a little stronger in him. I'm going to wrap up with the last part. And I, I'm going to read this to you because it's important. It says, he entered the synagogue and for three months spoke spoli. Bold, spoli? That could be spoke boldly. Reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. They continued for two years so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. All right, Ephesus has got a, a church, a good church. For two years, Priscilla and Aquila, they have been there. They've been leading the church, but it predominantly was effective among the Gentile people. So Paul comes back in, he's refreshed. He's been, he's been getting charged back up. He gets back to Ephesus. It's two, two and a half years later. And he comes in there and you know what? I don't know if they had this conversation, but I'm just throwing it out there. Hey, we're not, we're not really reaching the Jewish people very good. Paul, because who, who would be better to do it than the poster child of, of Judaism gone Christianity, Right. So, Paul, help us out here. Because remember, when he was there the first time, he didn't stop. He didn't do much of anything. He just stopped, dropped them off, and left. So, he goes into the synagogue, and for three months, he begins to show them from the prophets, from the scriptures, from the promises, that Jesus is the fulfillment of everything, that he is the Messiah, that he's the Lord, the Savior of the world. And at the end of three months, all they got to do is just be critical of the whole gamut of Christianity. So he backs up and he goes, okay. Listen to me. When people don't want to receive, don't, don't keep trying to give them something. You don't put good seed on unplowed soil. All right, just a waste of your seed. And people are argumentative and people are not interested. Just let them be. Let them be. The best thing you can do for them is begin to call their name out in prayer that God would turn that hard heart into a soft heart that they would be receptive. Amen. And God who loves them will begin to go to work on them. But the bottom line is, is in this particular case, <clears throat> He just backs away and he goes, all right. And he gathers, the Bible says, who? The disciples. Who is that? That's the church that, he, that is there. And so he says, come on. We're not welcome here. They're not interested. And so they began to meet in Tyrannus, the hall of Tyrannus. And he begins to just preach. 
and he begins to spread the good news. And I want you to get this. He spent three months over here and all they wanted to do was argue. Nobody was interested. He goes over here and he spends two years preaching truth to people who want to hear, who have a receptiveness to it. And the Bible tells us that all of Asia and the area around Ephesus heard the gospel. And the church became powerful as he brought in the people. <clears throat> I'm going to encourage you in something. Invite people to church. You should always invite them. Mostly invite them to the first service, if you don't mind. But no. But invite people, okay? But you should invest your time and the good work of Jesus and your knowledge of the Bible. You should invest that in soil that's got some rows and some plowing in it. Be sensitive. Again, that's the reason why I believe the Holy Spirit is so important. Be sensitive. Sometimes the, the Lord, the Holy Spirit will just say, hey, invest right here. Invest right here. And man, you, be, you, you didn't even know it was a plowed field and ready, but man, they just start soaking it up, listening to everything you got to say. And then sometimes you just say, hey, if you're ever interested, why don't you come join us at Center Bethel? And they'll probably do like many of the people you've been invited in the bathroom. Because eh. they're not ready. But I look around and I see a lot of people that are, have responded because they were ready. Whether it was just to come and be a part. Or whether it was to give their heart to the Lord or whatever it was. But praise God. Father, I pray right now you would help us as children of God with the sensitivity of your Holy Spirit to look into the fields and see those that are white at harvest. Lord, help us to see where we need to be investing the good seed of the word into people's hearts and lives. Lord, what you want to do, I believe you're wanting to do very quickly now. And, and Lord, I believe these are a time when we should never pass up an opportunity to share the love of Jesus with anybody that's willing to listen. Help us be bold and help us be faithful. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.